All right, let's just get this over with. We open up with a narration from Galadriel, where she reminisces on the light of the two trees. In addition to this, we have some exposition, which is delivered in the bizarre form of a conversation between Galadriel and Finrod as to why ships float. The analogy doesn't make any sort of sense, and there's a lazy attempt to hide information from the audience with a purposeless whisper. Finrod seems to predict his death, which doesn't really make sense, but oh well. Then we get some short comments about how Morgoth destroyed the two trees, and that made the elves very, very angry. The narration continues, with Galadriel saying that the elves, by which I presume she means the Noldor, swore vengeance against Morgoth for the death of the two trees. What's annoying about this is that I've read almost every single story Tolkien wrote about the two trees, but the showrunners did absolutely nothing to allow the audience to understand just how glorious those things were. They show Laurelin shining brightly, and... Telperion being clearly in one of his waning phases, and that's all we get of the two trees, is a few brief seconds of that. I felt nothing when I saw them wither, so I don't even empathize with the Noldor right now. There's no mention of Ungoliant, though I suppose that's to be expected. No mention of Fanor or the Silmarils either, which is honestly unacceptable. Fanor is arguably the single most important character in the whole history of the Silmarillion, and at the very least he's the foundation upon which Tolkien's Legendarium is even able to function, and yet his influence on the Noldor has been all but erased from the story. As such, the entire reason for the High Elves coming to Middle-earth has been reduced to nothing more than petty revenge. That's not what Middle-earth looked like in the First Age. The sinking of Balerion still happens in the show, since we see it at the end of this section of the prologue. I presume that they designed this entire set just for this shot? At the very least, they could have shown Balerion on the map. She says that Morgoth loses the war in the end. There's no mention of the Valar, so I presume that it's the Noldor who defeated him. So I guess Tolkien just didn't know what he was talking about when he said that the war of the Noldor against Morgoth was without final hope of victory. And I guess it was Morgoth who caused all this destruction? Who knows, maybe they'll show what actually happened in the War of Wrath later. Galadriel continues her narration by saying that Sauron was the one who took over after Morgoth's death, which isn't exactly what happened, but is good enough as a summary. It's a bit concerning that they call him a sorcerer, but there's a good possibility that they mean this in a lore-accurate way, so let's go with that. What's stranger about this is the comment that Morgoth's orcs spread far and wide, and yet they are apparently so rare that everyone is convinced that the threat they pose is over. Not sure how that works out, but maybe we'll find out later. So Finrod, after the war against Morgoth was successful, pledges to find Sauron and kill him. Genuine question. Why? Seriously, if the purpose of the Noldor coming to fight against Morgoth was as revenge for the darkening of Valinor, and that's the cited reason Galadriel gives later in the episode, why are they chasing Sauron? He has absolutely nothing to do with the darkening of Valinor, and you guys apparently aren't crafting kingdoms for yourself anymore, or at least that's not why you said you were here. You might be thinking, but Leif, Sauron is a big bad evil guy. Alright, fine. Why do the elves care though? In the book they care because Sauron is contesting them for rulership of Middle-earth after the forging of the Rings of Power and Gilgalad and Elrond can tell there's something off about him. But as far as we know, there is literally nothing Sauron has done other than kill Finrod, which would merit this pursuit. And you can't use the killing of Finrod as Finrod's justification for his vow to find Sauron. Then we've got Galadriel and a group of other elves, all wearing plate and mail, while they climb up a sheer cliff in the frozen cold. <sighs> now... I don't know whether or not this is possible, but my inclination is to say that it's not, since even if these elves are strong enough to lift themselves all this way, that ice would probably break from their constant hammering and their collective weight at one point or another. And that's ignoring the fact that they should all be frozen to death. Don't know who this guy is, even though I saw his name at one point in the description, so let's call him Todd. Todd complains that they should have turned back a while ago, and Galadriel says that no one wants to do that. They eventually find... Uh, um some place, and then Galadriel finds the symbol which marked her brother's dead body, which proves that Sauron was here at some point in the past. So the elves then find a snow troll, uh, okay, and they all prove absolutely worthless in fighting against it. But luckily, we have Galadriel here, and she coordinates with Todd so that she gets boosted up with his sword and- wait, what? Okay, so remember how everyone was complaining about Legolas defying gravity in the Battle of the Five Armies? This is arguably worse. Okay, anyway, so Todd convinces the others to mutiny, and Galadriel is forced to turn back, though as Elrond later points out, that wasn't actually a mutiny, and that's the end of the prologue. Oh gosh, what a rough start.
I don't know if I'm going to be able to last. By the way, Galadriel's character description says that she's the commander of the Northern Armies, and that's what Elrond calls her later. Was this really what that was talking about? She gets shipped off to Valinor by the end of the episode, so I can't imagine she's going to be in a position of leadership for any Northern Armies anytime soon. What does this even mean for her as a status quo? By the way, considering how little tangible, sensible information we've been given about what's going on throughout this entire prologue, and considering how what little information that we've been given given which is intelligible either contradicts Tolkien's world or is trivial, it honestly would have been better if we just didn't have this prologue. The destruction of the two trees has no tangible effect on the plot of the story other than allowing Galadriel to complain more, since it's so far removed from the conflict by the time we get to the action. And given that the Noldor coming to Middle-earth is just a revenge plot, and there's almost nothing about the creation of kingdoms and the wonders of Middle-earth apart from the Valar, the elves should honestly just be going home. Next we've got the Harfoots. Oh dear. Okay, well, so they're hiding from a group of hunters, and we see that their modus operandi is to utilize moss and grass hats, as well as their small stature to disguise their dwelling places. The word is given that the coast is clear by the elder who smells that the hunters have gone away, and then he goes and checks his book to see that after hunters comes wolves. While everyone is getting back to business, we see a woman calling out for Nori. Nori, however, has gone off with a group of small children to what is the old farm to pick berries, which she apparently is not supposed to be doing. Nori is shown a footprint by one of the children and recognizes it as a wolf's. She also notices that a wolf is likely nearby. She manages to successfully defuse the situation by getting her friend Poppy to understand that there's a wolf nearby without letting the other children know. I guess this is meant to show that she's adventurous and is willing to break the rules, but also has a good enough understanding of the world to keep herself and everyone else out of harm's way. Daily reminder that Galadriel is likely thousands of years older than Elrond and will eventually be Elrond's mother-in-law. Which reminds me, where's Celeborn? He's a Sindar from Doriath and he and Galadriel got married before Morgoth's downfall so he should be here. So Galadriel seems to be primarily concerned with the fact that Sauron is still alive or that he escaped. Two questions. Who was supposed to have captured or killed him? Was it the Valar? And second, if Finrod died and was branded by Sauron, then that means you already knew he was still out there. This mark of being in a frozen fortress to the north doesn't actually mean anything. So I will admit that I actually find Nori to be charming, and I kind of like Largo as a character. I think he's kind of fun. Haven't you ever wondered? What else is out there? Ah, so this is where that line comes from. Except it might actually be worse than it was in the trailer. Not sure. Haven't you ever wondered? What else is out there? Which reminds me, the dialogue in this show is awful. Some people have been saying that the acting is bad, and it is sometimes, but I generally disagree. I think the actors are doing okay with what they have been given, but it's just everything about the writing is awful. Why does Elrond seem to be acting as if he's the general secretary of Gilgalad? Did he actually write a speech for Gilgalad? Oh my gosh, this is silly. Then we get this. As a measure of our gratitude, these heroes shall be granted an honor unrivaled in all our law. They will be escorted to the Grey Havens and granted passage across the sea to dwell for all eternity in the blessed realm, the far west, the undying lands of Valinor. At last, they are going home. I'm sorry. What? Okay, nothing about this makes any sense, in any way, at all whatsoever. So, rather than the call of Valinor being a general command given to all the Eldar by the Valar, it seems that one has to be given a certain rank or honor in order to be allowed passage? Why? What's preventing all the elves from going to the Grey Havens right now? They're evidently not resisting the call to Valinor, besides maybe Galadriel, and they all want to go but they just can't for some reason? In the books, the idea is that the elves are all collectively resisting wanting to go back into the west and wanting to stay in Middle-earth. Now they make it sound as if they're all yearning to go to Valinor, but just can't. Why? Who made Gilgalad in charge of sending people to Valinor? What is going on? The evil is gone. Then why is it not gone from in here? <sighs> Look, we already know that Galadriel is going to turn out to be right in the end, but she is making some horrible arguments. Elrond is honestly right. The fact that she found a mark in some abandoned frozen wasteland doesn't mean that Sauron is still a threat. Galadriel has literally proven nothing. <sighs> then we get this line. But you have not seen what I've seen. I have seen my share. You have not seen what I have seen. 
Now, the interesting thing is that this line was shown in juxtaposition with the image of the War of Wrath in the trailer, which Elrond did see, which was confusing. So then I thought, maybe this scene with Galadriel and Numenor putting her hands on the Palantir would come before this line, but no. It looks like she won't get to Numenor until an episode or two from now, which means that Galadriel literally hasn't seen more than Elrond that would make her certain that Sauron is returning. She says something about how evil doesn't sleep, it waits, and then strikes at their moment of complacency. From this line, it seems that she's referring to the destruction of the two trees, since Morgoth destroyed them during a festival. Ignoring the fact that, if anything, complacency was at its lowest during that time, the only reason I'm even able to make that connection is because I've read The Silmarillion. Nothing in the show has communicated that this is what she's talking about. Maybe they should have done better with that opening exposition dump. But if that is what they're referencing, then why do they make it so that you can only understand this line if you've read the books and then screw up all of their references to the books? Who is this show even for? No one in history has ever refused the call. Um, what? Okay, that might actually be the worst line so far. The Call can either refer to Oromes hearkening the original elves to make the great journey with him to Valinor, or it can refer to the fact that the High King of the Valar called the Noldor back to Valinor. In both cases, the Call has been refused by literally millions of elves. That's why there are elves in Middle-earth in the first place. What is even going on? Who wrote this? And now we arrive at the, uh... Southlands. I'm pretty sure this is east of Mordor. Don't they have a better name for it? Here it's clear that the writers heard that Sylvan Elves were Dark Elves and took that a little bit too literally. Ismail puts on his acting face for this scene. Very intimidating. Okay, so the line... The lot you lump us in with died off a thousand years ago. Doesn't make sense. First off, no they didn't. Given the compressed timeline in the show, and that Galadriel implies that it's only been centuries at the beginning, it's basically impossible that the Easterlings of Hithlum died off a thousand years ago, even if they all died in the War of Wrath, which I'm pretty sure is actually not what happened. Second, while it is true that Easterlings, quote-unquote, served Morgoth, those probably had zero connection to the Easterlings of Lord of the Rings. I don't think Morgoth was drawing new recruits from anywhere east of Eriador by the time you get to the Battle of Unnumbered Tears. Also, dude says... Our true king will return. And I'd really like to know who this is referring to, because if it's Sauron, then I have quite a few problems. Finally, this is the East. Why is almost everyone white? This looks like an early medieval European village. I was passing through. We crushed the petals to form a cell. You crushed them. <sighs> Far be it for me to pull a CinemaSins, but uh, skip. This whole conversation between Maethor and yes, his name is Maethor, not Maidhor or whatever that other guy says, and Aaron Deer is bizarre. The humor falls flat. Or do you think me blind? No. I think you talk too much. And you smell of rotten leaves. No, I don't. And this dude says something that is literally false. Only twice in known history has a pairing between elves and humans even been attempted, and on each occasion, it ended in tragedy. Baron and Luthien's life didn't end in tragedy. In fact, they actually lived pretty happily after the ruin of Doriath, both dying of old age with their son Dior. Neither did Tuor and Indral's life end in tragedy, where Tuor is said to have been the only human who is counted as mortal with the elves. No, their relationship certainly did not end in tragedy. So Maethor asks Arendir why he insists on loving this woman since he's going to die if he does, but uh, before he can answer, they're told by this dude that the High King has declared that the war is over. Okay. First off, how on earth is Gilgalad the High King over the Sylvan Elves all the way out in the east? Secondly, where can I get the jetpack that this guy is using? I will admit, it's very impressive for the show to have already unlocked teleportation by the first episode. Most bad shows need to level up for that by waiting until later seasons. Mother. <sighs> I'm so glad that this show has the courtesy to keep brushing everything along like this, especially when it comes to their relationship. Luckily, Ismail maintains his acting face. Okay, so this is gross. And this guy came to her saying, like, do you heal animals too? My cow is sick in some way, shape, or form. I'm sorry, does this guy not milk his cows? What does he use them for? And yet, I will admit that I actually like the idea of orcish corruption causing the animals to malfunction bodily. One of the main ways Morgoth's power manifests is in death and decay of the things around him, so this actually kind of makes sense in principle. Then we see Galadriel going on the ship to Valinor, and they're all standing in a very uncomfortable position. She has passed beyond my sight. <sighs> okay, well, so I'm going to pull Glidus and say, Have you seen Lord of the Rings? A good quarter of the dialogue in this show feels like it was pulled almost directly from the Draxon trilogy. And what's interesting is that most of the time, it's not even the good lines that are getting pulled. Gandalf's comment about how, Frodo has passed beyond my sight. 
is dumb because it implies that up until Frodo made it down the slopes of F.L. Duath, Gandalf was watching him. Gandalf does say that Frodo has passed beyond his help in the book, but that's in the context of something that happened at the end of Fellowship of the Ring. Actually, you know what? Hold on. I'm not even supposed to be talking about those movies right now. <sighs> All right, let's, let's get back to the show. Gilgalad attempts to wax poetic about how... Well, the same wind that seeks to blow out a fire may also cause its spread. Now, I actually love characters who use metaphor and riddles to characterize their position and explain wisdom. And as far as metaphors go, this is probably the best one in the show so far, since it's actually intelligible and has real meaning. The problem is, is that it doesn't make sense given the context. So the fire Galadriel seeks to stamp out is Sauron and the orcs. And as Elrond notes, Gilgalad seems to think that Sauron really is out there. Why on earth does Gilgalad seem to think that by withdrawing and getting everyone not to worry, he's preventing the evil from spreading? Gilgalad is many things, but stupid is not one of them. This is a very bad characterization to start off. And given his character's description, I dread to think of where this is going. Furthermore, the implication of the scene seems to be that Gilgalad and Celebrimbor mutually came up with the idea of forging the rings, or what would eventually become the rings. This this is one of the problems with getting rid of Anatar as one of the main characters of the story. The people of Huldum are known for having been especially strong in the loyalty to Morgoth. Again, this idea doesn't make any sense. I'm not going to pretend as if Morgoth had absolutely no influence east of the Misty Mountains, or that only a small group of men in Beleriand had been corrupted by him, but I doubt if many people this far east had ever even heard of Morgoth or any of his servants. I mean, Look at this town. Okay, yes, it's burned down, but imagine what it would have been like normally. Can you honestly imagine this being at all relevant to Morgoth? Why would they have even noticed each other? And at last we come to... this whole sequence. Okay, everything is wrong here. First off, it was never established from the prologue that Valinor was still a place of light and joy. The last we see of Valinor is after it's been darkened, and no description of how the sun and moon were made enters the show. This is another one of the many instances where the show literally only works if you've already read The Silmarillion, but then they mess up everything from The Silmarillion. Who is this show for? I honestly have no idea why Valinor is being portrayed as this all-consuming light into which the elves are being literally swallowed up. And yes, I know that these clouds are the other side of where the High Elves left at the beginning. It still doesn't make any sense. And what's worse is that this is being juxtaposed with the coming of Meteor Man, but I'll get to him after next episode. Galadriel looks at Finrod's knife again while Todd extends his hand, and it is then that Galadriel remembers the words Finrod spoke to her in Valinor about why ships float while rocks don't. And at last, we finally get to learn what he whispered at the beginning of the episode. All right, so let's try to make sense of this. So Finrod asks Galadriel, do you know why ships float? It's because they're seeking the light of the stars while rock sinks because they look downward. Which, in addition to not being true, doesn't even really make sense as a metaphor. But young Galadriel understands it completely, and so she points out that sometimes the light of the stars reflects in the ocean. Therefore, she asks, how am I to know which light to follow? Which doesn't have anything to do with how ships float. But luckily, Finrod is ready with a response by saying... Sometimes we cannot know until we have touched the darkness. One of the things that is frustrating about reviewing or critiquing movies or shows like this is that as a critic, I like to try to show to the audience that I have some level of understanding of the show before I try to tell you what's good or bad about it. But the problem with this is that, ultimately, just simply by doing this, I show that I've put more effort into thinking and making sense of these lines of dialogue or these scenes than the writers have. And even with that in mind, I'd like to offer three possible interpretations for what this is even supposed to mean. First, Galadriel has now touched the darkness in her life at Middle-earth, and thus has discerned that the light of Valinor is not the light that she's meant to follow. Therefore, she abandons it and goes back to seek the true light in Middle-earth. Two. Galadriel has decided to be the rock in the metaphor, and therefore abandons the ship, which is following the light. Thus, 
she plunges into the water. And three, Galadriel believes she's still not yet touched the darkness, so to say, and therefore does not know which light to follow. Therefore, she plunges back into the sea to fulfill the metaphor and learn which light she is to follow. I guess three is the one which technically makes the most sense, but the problem is that none of these should be stirring up any form of a super emotional reaction from her, other than just simply remembering, oh, yeah, that's right, my brother died in the past, you know, back then, when Sauron got him. That makes me sad. In addition to the metaphor being basically meaningless, both in terms of why ships float, as well as the moral situation Galadriel finds herself in, it honestly doesn't matter which of these three interpretations you go with, they just simply don't inform her decision given everything we've seen from her. The opening scene is dumb. It doesn't make sense. It's a lazy attempt to set up a payoff with the most banal form of hiding information from the audience imaginable, and the fact that it serves only as a setup for this exact payoff, more than anything else in this entire show, in encapsulates the utter absurdity of this opening episode. <sighs> Moving on, Galadriel abandons Todd and is now stranded in the middle of the ocean and probably off the coast of Tol Arisea, which leads us directly into episode 2, where Galadriel is attempting to swim back to Middle-earth. And it is here that I want to point out that, um, she's dead. I simply cannot stress enough the fact that the Sundering Sea which divides Middle-earth from Valinor is huge. It is large enough that the Numenorians can sail westward far enough to be out of sight of their coasts on a flat earth, yes, the earth is flat in the Second Age, and still not be within sight of Tol Arisea, which is an island off of the coast of Valinor. I know that Galadriel is an elf, but that doesn't mean she can't get tired or exhausted. If we assume that she was swimming non-stop the entire time, it would take weeks for her to even get to Numenor Numenor, let alone Middle-earth. She's going to pass out hundreds of leagues away from the nearest coastline, drown, and get consumed by fish, gradually tearing off all of her flesh down to the bone. Furthermore, as shown in this episode, there are sea monsters of sorts out here, as well as presumably sharks and other things which would provide potential hazards. Ah, but wait, you say, she ended up making it because there was a raft of non-Numenorian men floating about out here. Well, first off, she didn't know that that was going to happen, so this is still dumb. Second off, what on earth are these people doing out here? So... For those of you who don't know, there are primarily two types of men in Middle-earth. There are the Numenorians, who are descended from men who befriended the elves in the First Age, and then there are middlemen, who, I guess, are the ones that you would call the normal men of Middle-earth. One of the reasons the Numenorians became so important in the history of Middle-earth is that they were the only men who made use of seaworthy ships. Now, since we know that these people aren't Numenorians, and since this is even further west than the Numenorians are allowed to be sailing, why are they here? How are they here? Well, anyway, they take Galadriel aboard and find out that she's an elf and remember that there's a studio-mandated blind hatred of the elves amongst all the men of Middle-earth. Therefore, they show lots of suspicion until it's revealed that there's a ship nearby. Suddenly, they're worried about corsairs. Really? What are corsairs doing, again, this far west? You really think they sailed out this far into the middle of the ocean just to catch your dinky raft? Anyway, it turns out it's not a corsair ship. It's a sea monster wearing the ship as its hat. Great. One of the women gets angry at Galadriel for leading the thing towards them, and shoves her into the water. The sea monster then circles about and kills everyone. Except for this dude, who manages to detach part of the raft and gets away. Not sure why the sea monster doesn't kill him, or Galadriel for that matter, but I guess the knife provides plot armor. Not sure what this guy's excuse is, though. Anyway, he then rows back, picks up Galadriel, who finds out that they belong to a kingdom, or a homeland, which was destroyed by the orcs. A storm comes, and Galadriel sinks to the bottom of the ocean and dies. Ah. <sighs> best part of the episode so far. Very bold of this show to kill off their main character in the second episode, but I guess that plot armor is only so thick. Now, dear viewer, I have a couple of things I'd like to talk to you about. An essential aspect of any story is the concept of tension. Tension, dear viewer, is maintained by having the audience truly believe that there are high stakes. However, what if you're someone who doesn't know what they're doing, and you're told to make things exciting? Well, the easiest way to do things is to constantly tease your audience with the notion that a character might die. Ignoring the fact that we already know Galadriel survives this series because she's in Lord of the Rings, we also simply know she's going to survive because she's the main character, and it's episode 2, and this would be the dumbest way for her to die humanly imaginable. If you want us to believe there's actual danger here, then stop putting people who obviously aren't going to die in situations where it would not only make more sense if they did, but where it's impossible for them to survive. 
All right, let's just move on. Another part of this episode is Arendir and Bronwyn's plot, where Ismail continues to maintain his acting face. Arendir looks at the ground and realizes that this is the work of something dangerous. Probably orcs, confirming his suspicions that evil is about. Therefore, he decides that the best way to deal with this situation is to go in all by himself, without alerting any of his fellow elves with the danger, and telling Bronwyn to go warn her village. She does so. But everyone thinks she's crazy, so she decides to go back home. Arendir is going through the tunnels, finds more of these signs that they keep teasing, and then runs away at the first sign of danger, because it turns out he doesn't think he can fight them, making his decision to go in alone all the more idiotic. So, he manages to slip through and get out of the water, and there was no tension here because they spoiled this part in the trailer and it's the most generic thing to happen possible. Alright, so we cut back to Bronwyn, who is running to her house for some reason. Maybe it's just to warn her son that they need to leave, but then she doesn't seem to be in any sort of a rush when she enters the building, only to find that it's been wrecked and there's a massive hole in the floor. She fears that her son, Theo, has been taken into it, but then finds him hiding. He tells her to get help, and she runs toward the door before realizing that people probably still won't believe her, and so she stays. Thus begins the most bizarre confusing sequence in either episode. An orc appears out of the tunnel and decides to slowly rummage about the room for some reason. He doesn't appear to be looking for anything in particular, but instead walks over to where the kid is hiding, looks at it, then goes to the medicine table before hearing Bronwyn make a sound. This makes the orc attack her, which causes Theo to stab him in the back, not sure how he was able to do that so quickly, which doesn't seem to kill, immobilize, or even meaningfully harm the creature. So, orcs are unreasonably tough and resistant to normal damage, so it takes a lot of effort to take them out. Fair enough. It'll be interesting to see how they develop this. However, the scene isn't over. The orc then slashes Theo, and he tries to escape before the orc throws the table at the door and charges the boy. Bronwyn says, Hey! Which convinces the orc to stop and turn towards her, pausing for several seconds as she begins to throw one of her medicine pots at the creature, blinding it before it takes off its mask. Not sure how it blinded the creature with the mask on, and made it unblind with the mask off, but let's ignore that. Now, Theo tries to run, and the creature seems intent on killing him rather than the woman who is bearing a weapon towards him. Bronwyn then charges the creature with what looks to be a saw, and once more plants it squarely in the creature's back. Once more, it seems like this does nothing to the orc, and it seems to stagger only because the blade gets caught in the ladder behind him. Again... Not sure how that happened, but let's ignore that. Theo then ties a rope around its neck, causing it to struggle and break the rope. It then walks forward to kill him, and Bronwyn screams for a good three seconds before cutting to her putting the orc's head on the table of the inn, which is apparently the only actual location in this town. Ah... <laughs> uh... Okay, so is the orc difficult to kill or not? It seems that the obvious answer is yes, and yet it still died in a single swipe to the head by a mother whose profession is a healer. So, I guess they simply weren't hitting it in the right place? I'm honestly wondering how I'm supposed to feel about orcs as a threat at this point. On the one hand, the threat of what is probably only a couple of them is so dangerous that it needs to be avoided at all costs by a trained elven warrior, and yet they can be defeated by an unprepared mother and son? This sequence would have been more effective if the two of them had just barely escaped from the creature, and then presented the wounds, mask, or some other token of the orc as evidence, rather than its rotting head. Well. In any case, the town is now going for the elven tower, and the kid takes this sword that isn't actually important enough for the plot of either episode for me to actually have mentioned it. This last part with the blood honestly looked kinda goofy to me, but I guess unlike normal blood, which looks downward, this blood looks towards the light and so doesn't sink. Remember kids, if your blood seems magically attracted to a broken sword, which then repairs itself by drawing in black smoke, it's time to lay off the drugs and get rid of the sword. Next, we have Elrond's plot for this episode, and it begins with the Great Ring Project, henceforth known as G... Yeah, no, I'm not doing that. Elrond and Celebrimbor are busy admiring Feanor's hammer, and since the writers abhor those who read the Silmarillion, they decided to talk about the Silmarils and Morgoth's theft of them here, rather than in the prologue for episode one. <sighs> Celebrimbor is telling Elrond about creating an enormous forge which they can use to create things which will change the nature of Middle-earth. Elrond asks what the problem is, and Celebrimbor says it needs to be made by spring. Elrond therefore suggests that they go to the dwarves. Now it seems clear based on Gilgalad's secret that's alluded to in his character description, as well as the I need this completed by spring line, that 
They are trying to build some semblance of a mystery, likely with Sauron, when it comes to the forging of the Rings of Power. I'm going to ignore that until we actually see what the payoff of all this is. In the meantime, I have to ask why Elrond is the one who's suggesting going to the dwarves. I mean, seeing as Eregion was originally founded next to Casa Doom specifically so that the Noldor living there would be in close communion with the dwarves, but oh well. Now, they moved Eregion farther away, so maybe that just isn't the case in this timeline, but what follows still doesn't make any sense. The dwarves apparently have a similar hatred for elves as the writers do for their audience, and want nothing to do with them. Why? I know that by the time of Lord of the Rings, the elves and the dwarves were estranged, but this was a time of great commerce and cooperation between the Noldor and the dwarves of Casa Doom. This is even pointed out by the very door which the Fellowship uses to get into Moria. The phrase, speak friend and enter, is only difficult for Gandalf to figure out because the mere request to say the word friend as the quote-unquote password felt like a trick in such distrustful times. What's worse is that Elrond is already friends with Durin and knows their secret rights, which means that he's lived among them and befriended them in the past. So, what is it that's caused the dwarves to be so inimical with the elves? What has caused Durin to abhor them and to spit on his past friendship with Elrond? You missed my wedding! Apparently, Elrond, in pre-Dunadan hectic Eriador, which seems to have few roads or routes directly from one place to another, didn't take the time to travel all the way from Linden just to go to Durin's wedding. Now, I suppose this is simply because Durin is the only character in the show who understands that everyone is actually using jetpacks to travel and is sick and tired of people like Elrond pretending that it takes time and effort to go from one place to another. Ignoring that, this is absolutely ridiculous. This is the sort of reaction you might expect from someone who lives in the modern world with things like cars and airplanes, and the comment that 20 years may be the blink of an eye to an elf. But I've lived an entire life in that time. Is bizarre not only because 20 years isn't even that long in the lifespan of a dwarf, but even among modern day humans, it's not unheard of that they will be separated for years or even decades. And while we're here, Elrond should be gone. What's the point of this elaborate ceremony with implicit oaths and accepted terms if it can be undone by like, what, the prince's wife? Who's making this decision? I know that in the modern world we don't take these sort of ceremonies seriously, but Again, for ancient peoples, even ignoring Middle-earth, upholding these sorts of oaths is an essential aspect of proving your trustworthiness. The dwarves had no reason that we can tell for being distrustful of Elrond before today, but now they do since he stayed in Moria after accepting banishment. I'm going to be ignoring Durin's pet tree because everything about that was silly. Oh, and this crown is awful. It's not even awful as something that doesn't properly follow Tolkien's lore. Just look at it. It's hideous. Why are you wearing that? Now, you might have realized that I largely ignored Nori's plot for this episode, and the honest reason for that is that I don't have that much to say about it. It's a sequence of events happening with almost no through line and acts as a setup for we know not what. It's clear that this person, whoever he is, is a Maya of some sort, given his ability to affect the trees and the fireflies, but there's something about him that is a corrupting influence, given things like the falling leaf that Gilgalad sees juxtaposed to his falling last episode. Similarly, speech to the fireflies causes the ones he didn't talk to to collapse once he collapses. We have a little bit of character development for Nori. We see that she's protected and she believes that this man landed nearby because the universe wanted him to be under her protection or something like that, which is fine. In fact, I'm actually kind of interested to see how that's developed later this season. But the problem with this little bit of character development is that it's sandwiched in a plot that is so drawn out and unengaging that only the existence of this YouTube channel actively propelled me to keep watching. Not to mention that there's so much cheap tension which never amounts to anything and leads to a series of anticlimaxes throughout this part of the story. With the worst case being when Meteor Man is trying to communicate with Nori being juxtaposed with her father breaking his foot. I suppose it's meant to show that Nori is being negligent or irresponsible, but but in that case, it's a payoff without a setup, as we're never told that she was supposed to be there in the first place. Not to mention that she immediately takes responsibility despite the lack of setup, as soon as she realizes her father is hurt, which doesn't seem to be what an irresponsible child would do, but oh well. All of this, in the end, is just to give us the conclusion that the Meteor Man is trying to get these girls to help him find those stars, so... Maybe that will make sense by the end of the season, but for now, I don't even know what that's supposed to mean. How does one find those stars other than by looking up? What would finding those stars even mean in a practical context? 
I guess we'll have to find out next time in another exciting episode of Dragon Ball Z. The episode ends with Galadriel worn and passed out on the raft with presumably a Numenorean ship overlooking her and her companion, showing us that she can indeed get exhausted, even if it's from lack of oxygen or something, and that she will likely be going to Numenor within the next couple of episodes. All right, we're done. What a convulsing cesspool of an opening for a brand new TV show. I heard numerous comments both before and after the premiere that this was an attempt to Game of Thronesify the Lord of the Rings, and yet, regardless of whether that was the intention, they couldn't even get the basic mechanics of setting up a fantasy show right here. Game of Thrones began with a relatively short scene which built the beginnings of a haunting mystery about what lay north of the wall, and quick and efficient introductions which both effectively built the world, set up everyone's characterization, and introduced the main plot for everyone who was at Winterfell as well as Daenerys, and it did this because of one primary quality cohesion. The majority of action took place at Winterfell among family members or members of the King's Company, and the only thing that took place elsewhere was Daenerys' storyline, the person whose family was dethroned by the very same king who visits the Starks. And what's fascinating about this is that, as far as Game of Thrones episodes go, it wasn't even that great. Fairly mediocre, actually. And yet, it might as well have been the single greatest episode in all of TV or cinema compared to this boring, slanderous compilation of nonsensical, unrelated scenes which one of the richest companies in the world decided to dedicate to the author of the 20th century. Every single storyline in this show, with the partial exception of Galadriel and Elrond in the first episode, not only happens in geographically remote areas, but lacks any sort of concrete or thematic cohesion with anything that's going on. The closest we get is that Gilgalad's demilitarization command somehow travels from Linden all the way past Mordor in what is presumably a few days, and all the characters looking at meteor man as a way to visually emphasize his importance. Which reminds me, the logistics of this show are already off the rails. There are some who have pointed out that the movement of the armies in the Lord of the Rings movies are unrealistic to the point of being absurd once you recognize just how long the distances are, but based on what we've seen just in these first two episodes, I'd take the most ridiculous estimates for the March of the uruk on Helm's Deep compared to anything we've seen in this show. Characters from the prologue onward will teleport where they were not seconds before. Messages or people will travel across countries or what is effectively a continent in the course of a few days. It takes Frodo almost a month to reach Rivendell. How on earth does this message get from Gilgalad to Erendir? And while we're on this topic, never before has this meteor made less sense than when we're shown its actual travel path in the show. So it passes over Linden because it's seen by Gilgalad. Elrond and Celebrimbor then see it as well, showing that these scenes are, in fact, playing in chronological order. Then it passes Erendir and Bronwyn, showing that the message has indeed been received shortly after it's been sent, and then it's seen by the Ents, who are presumably in or around what will be Fangorn, then at last it's seen by Nori and the Harfoots and lands nearby. Given how large it is when it's on the ground, for it to look this large in the sky, it would have to be relatively close. But more importantly, did the writers even look at this map? Why do I feel like the map designers in the writer's room were occupied by two entirely different sets of people who weren't allowed to talk to each other or ask questions? Another fascinating aspect of the show is the interesting choices for the races of the characters. No, I'm not talking about what you're thinking, you racist. I think everyone expected, based on how the majority of the characters were white in the promotional material, that the setting of the story was still going to be the northwestern portion of Middle-earth, primarily Eriador and Numenor. And the few black people, and I say black people because that's, for the most part, the only type of people of color we see in this show, were basically just characters which presumably should have been white and they just darkened their skin. However, what they actually did was even worse. Remember how people were suggesting that rather than race swap characters, what they should have done was show the civilizations of men who lived east and south of Mordor as a way to integrate diversity? What's interesting is that they do that. They show the Southlands, quote-unquote, east of Mordor, where Rune would eventually be, but they make most of the characters white Europeans. Why? This was a perfect opportunity to have Easterlings in your show and make them a more complex and interesting group of people than servants of Sauron like they are in Lord of the Rings. Why did you, to put it bluntly, whitewash them? 
you somehow managed to sell your show to an entire ideological group on the basis of diversity and representation when you somehow made Middle Earth more white than the Peter Jackson trilogy. Oh well, I guess the people who care about that don't know enough about Tolkien to recognize the irony anyway. I've decided to ignore the fact that the Harfoots might as well not have existed for the Second Age to focus on the more pressing issue. As an execution of the idea of ancient hobbits, they are bafflingly uninspired. They're nomadic people in Ravania, on the lands east of Anduin, which is fine, but they have the same reserved, mind-your-own-business, almost xenophobic attitude which the settled Third Age Shire hobbits have. What's worse is that the names they have follow the same conventions as Third Age Shire hobbits as well, such as Poppy and Sadok, and they have similar last names as well. Ignoring the fact that Brandyfoot makes absolutely no sense as anyone's last name, considering that Brandybuck was based on the old bucks who settled near the Brandywine River. Eleanor, or Nori, having an elvish name doesn't even make sense with the world as the showrunners have set it up. A friend of mine pointed out after we watched the episodes, the Harfoot name should honestly be something like Smeagol or Deagle, or something at least as alien as that. Now, if you've at all paid attention during this video, you will have noticed that I repeatedly pointed to the ways in which the events and backstory of these episodes radically differs from the world Tolkien created in almost every single way, outside of, I guess, the most basic facts like the existence of Valinor and Numenor. Some might consider these sorts of comparisons to be unfair, since while this is adapting Tolkien's world, it's also meant to be a work in its own right and therefore should be judged as such. I disagree for two reasons, besides those I've already mentioned and talked about in previous videos. First, the stated method the writers had for how they adapted the show is that they study the books and develop things in as Tolkienian a way as possible. Go back to the book, go back to the book, go back to the book. Therefore, it seems more than appropriate to discuss just how divergent this show is from the books. More importantly, though, it's excusable to change aspects of the source material in order to make your adaptation better as a story, but quite literally every single change from the book to the show, without exception, makes the characters less believable and interesting, the world less coherent and usable as a background, and the overall story worse. Some people, who I can only imagine have neither read The Silmarillion or The Lord of the Rings, seem to be under the impression that the show doesn't depart enough from Tolkien, since it seems to be just another good versus evil story. They are apparently blissfully unaware that it was Tolkien who made the more complex and interesting story for this time period, where the elves had multifaceted motivations both for their pursuit of Morgoth and their staying in Middle-earth. They wanted to retrieve the Silmarils, they wanted to exercise rulership over Middle-earth, they wanted the freedom of the Valar that the East offered, they loved the beauty of the world, and they wanted to flee the wrath of the Valar. In the show, this is all reduced to mere revenge, and revenge that expires before the start of the actual story. They changed Elrond into a politician, when he functioned better as a master of lore and a herald of Gilgalad. They got rid of Celeborn in his marriage to Galadriel, making Galadriel's one character thread that she's attempting to avenge her brother, making her, at best, a two-dimensional person. Person. The elves and dwarves of khazad being antagonistic makes no sense, and merely adds baggage to an already boring and drawn-out episode, and the explanation for said antagonism goes unexplained in the case of elves in general, and is absurd in the case of Elrond, Sauron existing as some far-off secretive dread who is gathering power in the shadows, and is using his tunneling orcs as a mean of launching attacks against simple villages, is simply less interesting and meaningful compared to the openly soft-spoken and friendly Anatar, who deceives the elves of Eregion by giving them genuine knowledge and feeding them lies and suspicions about Gilgalad. And whatever the call is in the show, it simply makes less sense and is less interesting than the call in the books. In addition to this, Galadriel's sea voyage also makes no sense and puts her character in an impossible situation as far as survival is concerned, only to be rescued by another set of impossibilities. They really wanted Galadriel to go to Numenor. They should have just given her a reason to do so and then given her a ship. <sighs> To conclude, let's talk about what everyone seems to be saying is the saving grace of the show, the visuals. Now, I'm not going to lie, the show looks nice, and I can see that a lot of effort went into the production of the sound design and visuals. However, Honestly, it's not even that impressive. That may sound harsh, but it really isn't. It's pleasing to the eyes, but it's not exceptional by today's standards, and it's certainly not enough to redeem the rest of the show. I'm almost certain reading the reviews that the only reason anyone emphasizes how good the show looks is that there's nothing else to latch onto. And honestly, that's really the main problem with the show so far. We can quibble all day with how they're not properly adapting Tolkien's works and how they're not making that great of a story in the first place and how, well, it just simply isn't a good adaptation of the themes and ideas behind Tolkien's Second Age. But above all that, the show is just 
boring. When it comes to the parts that cost money, the show is fine, but any aspect of the story that takes talent, effort, and thought is sleep-inducing at best and infuriating at worst. There's a bizarre mix of completely disregarding everything that actually happened in the first and second ages, while also forcing the audience to rely on book knowledge for the narrative threads and dialogue to even make sense. And look, there are several ways that one can judge the quality of an adaptation. That's the problem that I've always found with watching shows like this, is that there are so many different standards that people are using to come to completely opposite interpretations. However, even with all that in mind, I can only ask the people who say that they love this show, how? Please, in tangible terms, explain exactly what it is that you like about this show, and why. These first two episodes fail in almost every single category of storytelling I can think of, to the point that I'm questioning whether or not the budget for this story was even as large as advertised. Anyway, that's enough for the first two episodes. I have more to say, but I'll save it for later reviews, and I hope you all enjoyed. I'll see you in a week for the next batch of Garbage Fires.